good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, uh, depending on where you're joining this webinar. Welcome to LMU's special panel discussion on international career pathways. My name is Yong Sun Pak. I'm a professor of international business and management at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California. And I'm also the director of the Center for International Business Education, often called CYBE or CYBER. This program is funded by the grants awarded by the US Department of Education. LMU is one of the 15 universities in the country that received these prestigious cyber grants. The LMU CYBE serves as regional as well as national resources to students, faculty, and business practitioners by connecting the workforce and technological needs of the US business community with international education, foreign language training, and research capacities. As part of our mission to help improve global competitiveness of the US companies and industries, LMU CYB has been offering special lecture series on various topics of international business of importance. Today, we have organized another, another interesting webinar to discuss international career path as part of the program to celebrate International Trade Month in May. We hope this webinar will provide a useful guide for our students who would like to pursue international business career in public and private sectors driven by a vibrant international trade ecosystem in Los Angeles. Since 1938, the U.S. has recognized May as World Trade Month and used it as an opportunity to celebrate the significance of international trade to the U.S. economy. As of 2019, exports of goods and services from the U.S. accounted for about 12% of our GDP. If you include imports of goods and services, international trade made up about 25% of the U.S. GDP. Today, we have invited several panelists who will share their successful international business career experiences and testify impacts of professional career on their personal as well as public life. So let me introduce our speakers. Our first speaker, um, Mrs. Ruth Emanuel, is a global education and business consultant pursuing an executive MBA at LMU. She has served as regional director for global trade for LA's network of 19 community colleges, advancing the state of California's workforce and economic development goals. She's so passionate about international career pathways and recently produced a Los Angeles global trade career guide with the LA Area Chamber of Commerce. Ruth was also part of uh, Mayor Eric Cassetti's international trade team responsible for implementing the mayor's export program. Thanks for joining our program today, Ruth. Our next speaker, Mrs. Jacobeth Bath Hernandez, is a career diplomat from the Mexican Foreign Service. And since July 2021, she has been serving as consul for economic affairs at the Consulate General of Mexico in Los Angeles. Consul Hernandez is responsible for promoting the relations with relevant economic actors in LA County to promote trade and investment opportunities with Mexico. Prior to her position in LA, she was in charge of Mexico's economic affairs in the states of New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. Our final speaker, Mr. Gerald Feeney, has worked in the global trade and logistics industry for the past 23 years. Jerry is the manager of strategic customers with DHL Global Forwarding, the world's leading logistics company with a global presence in over 220 countries and territories. In this role, he works with several of the world's most recognized consumer brands and Fortune 500 companies. He helps his clients navigate the regulatory and logistical challenges inherent with global trade and distribution. Thank you so much everyone for joining this webinar out of your very busy schedule. I would like to ask each speaker to talk about your own career path for about 10 to 12 minutes. Then we'll have a panel discussion together. So let's start with Ruth first. 
Uh, Ruth, would you please explain to us the key elements of a Los Angeles trade, global trade career guide you produced with the LA Area Chamber of Commerce? What motivated you to develop career guide? Um, you can offer some general advice for those who would like to pursue their career in international trade or international business in general. Thank you so much, Dr. Pack. I am going to share my screen because I have a presentation prepared for you all today. Uh, let's see, can everybody see my slides? Yes, we can see it. Perfect. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Pak, for the warm introduction. I'm really excited uh, to be here at LMU, my school right now, uh, to join all of you uh, to talk about a topic that I'm very passionate about, which is international career pathways. And today I really will center my talk around one theme, what I wish I knew as an undergrad, what I did well and what I could have done better. And I really hope that by sharing my career journey and my insights, and also resources such as the Global Trade Career Guide. I hope the students that are joining us and also the educators that are joining us will lead with a wealth of information to help navigate their global careers. So my career journey in a nutshell has been a very windy one. We often think of our career journey as starting after college, but I would argue that our career is a sum of our personal experiences, our values, our interests, along with our education and professional experiences. I was born in Ethiopia and lived in four countries before the age of 12. I grew up in the Middle East, in uh, Europe, and settled in Canada at the age of 12, as I mentioned. I went to the University of Toronto, where I majored in political science and double minored in Spanish and, econo in Spanish and economics. And I've called Los Angeles home now for the past 14 years. So as you can see, I had a very global, um, uh, foundation right from the start. What I was really intentional when I was earlier in college is really to pursue a global career. Didn't know what area I wanted, but I just knew that that was where my interest lied. So I was very intentional in really taking advantage of international abroad volunteer and work opportunities that were available to me. So prior to college or during college, I went and volunteered in Brazil for about three months through a program called Canada World Youth, which is similar to the Peace Corps here in the US. And following after college, I lived for a year in Mexico so that I could just immerse myself and also perfect my Spanish. These were among the best years of my life. And what I would encourage students to do is really to understand that your personal is professional. Recognize that your lived experience are very valid in building a viable professional career. The ability to adapt cross-cultural communication skills, empathize with other viewpoints is not only an important soft skill today, it's an important leadership quality that you can bring to any role, especially in a post-pandemic world we're living in. So I really, really encourage students to take advantage of study abroad or volunteer abroad opportunities that are available to you. And if you haven't lived anywhere or don't need to speak languages, it doesn't mean that you can't have an international career. By living in a global city like LA, there's ample opportunities to get uh, immersed in global experiences right here in your community, which we'll talk in a little bit more about, uh, in further in my presentation. So even after uh, doing the right things, getting that internship, learning the language, or even um, you know, living abroad, Sometimes the path after college is sometimes very daunting. Which way do you go? Even in an international arena, there's so many paths available. Do you focus on the public uh, sector, working in government? Do you work in the private sector in international business? Do you uh, work with international development agencies or even try to navigate a career in the United Nations? Those were the confusing area, area of options that were available to me. And sometimes with or, or more options, comes a lot of confusion. And one of the things that I've, I haven't done well in that part of my career is really ask for help. One of the things that I would have done better earlier on in my career is really network with professionals that are in the areas of interest that I'm available in. Maybe even have informational interviews or even seek out internship opportunities in this ar arena earlier on. I felt like at the earlier in my career, I kind of had a shot in the dark applied to a lot of jobs online, 
without really making the networks that are really important to build um, early in order to have a viable international career pathway. To make things more windy for me, I moved to Los Angeles 14 years ago for personal reasons. I met my husband who was based here and decided that I had to restart my career again. And moving to LA was a really challenging time for me because I've always perceived LA as a hub for, internet, for uh, entertainment, not necessarily international business. I always thought New York or DC would be the hub that naturally uh, comes to mind when you're thinking international business. And oh boy, was I surprised. As Dr. Pack mentioned in his introductory uh, uh, remarks, LA is really the hub of international goods movement. We have two of the largest port, the Port of Los Angeles and Port of Long Beach, right in our backyard and one of the busiest world uh, airports, LAX, which means that a lot of companies that are trying to access the global marketplace, especially the California marketplace called LA Home. And that means that a lot of uh, companies that are involved in international goods movements like DHL, which we'll hear from a little bit later, also call LA Home. This means a vast opportunities of international business jobs right here for us as students and as uh, professionals. So one of the things I did when I was working as a regional director was really bring this all these insight into a global trade career guide. This is one of the things that I really wish I had when I was early in my career. Have one-stop shop where I could access information about the different paths available, labor market information about job titles, salaries, all in one place, as well as hear from professionals about what it's like to work in these, in these uh, type of uh, roles. So the Global Trade Career Guide contains information on public sector paths, private sector paths, study abroad resources and internship scholarship all, op opportunities all in one document. And this guide really was a labor of love that was done in partnership with the LA Area Chamber of Commerce, who's really a leader um, in the international trade community. They've organized the World Trade Week celebration for over 90 years. And really to have their partnership of uh, the committee members who are really leaders in the space contributing to the guide was invaluable. And so as you can see, what we did with the career guide is we really broke down the paths available in international business or global trade here. We really broke it down into the functions that are, um, that are really important to businesses uh, that are operating internationally. One of the areas in the private sector that is really, really, really viable and um, here is supply chain and logistics. But every uh, uh, global business also need people needs people in sales and marketing and operations, in e-commerce, and we really are also a hub for innovation and entrepreneurship and really need our entrepreneurs not only to think local, but also global. Another important area that we highlighted in the Global Trade Career Guide is public sector careers. Often when we're coming into college, we don't think of careers in government earlier on. We think maybe government is a career path that you want to do when you want to retire. But there's a lot of viable career paths for students at every level in the government. There's so many federal agencies even hiring people from the uh, West Coast. A lot of people don't know that the largest uh, uh, employers uh, outside of DC, uh, federal employees, are located right here in California. So we break down the different agencies that are involved in international trade and also offer tips about how to apply to public sector careers in this guide. And in terms of the city and county careers, often a lot of students don't know that ports and airports are under the jurisdictions of the city and states as of the cities. So often there's also a different path to apply for jobs uh, that is a little bit more unique than the private sector. So all of that information is really available in the career guide. And we really, really encourage you as a student or as an educator helping students navigate careers to really go in and really check it out. I'll try to navigate here, but it's all housed under a website um, specifically dedicated for the guide called Global Careers Hub. And really we try to make the guide as interactive as possible because we don't want to have, uh, we want it to be more of a resource document that you can come in from time to time. And as you can see here, it's 
available in all formats, mobile and also PDF. So you can also share it with, um, with your classes and really has a lot of, a lot, a lot, a lot of tips and resources, especially around jobs and internships, an area that we see here students asking for help over and over again. So we really, really encourage you to go and check out the site and really share it with your students. And finally, um, the Global Careers Hub is another passion project that will be following the Global Career Guide. Often students ask, great, I have this guide, but now where do I find jobs and internships? So we're really hoping that we can have a one-stop shop also for jobs and internship curated by uh, technical experts on globalcareershub.com that I'm hoping to really work on while I'm here at LMU. So to, to sum it all, I would say to students, always align yourself with institutions that have, or employers that have a global outlook. That was one of the reasons why I chose to come to LMU and study my executive MBA, because they have the glo a global community outlined right here in their mission statement. So it's important for you to seek out and be resourceful among employers that also have a global um, outlook. And finally, I would leave students with three uh, sets of advice that would have served me well. One is to be kind to yourself. Career is not a linear process, it's often windy. And second is to really network, network. As you can see, I've shared my LinkedIn, so connect with me and other professionals that you've heard from here. And third, to always think big and always think global. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Ruth. And um, I think that as a first speaker, you really set the tone so you mentioned about, you know, career path, both in public and also the private sector. So that is perfect to introduce our next speaker. So we have one um, panelist that, uh, who had a very successful career in the public sort of sector and, um, and the other person in the private sector. So before I move to the next speaker, I just have a simple question. Is Career Guide free of charge? Or is it anybody can <laughs> or do we have to pay? Of course. Yes, the Career Guide was um, produced in uh, thanks to funding from our community colleges and also in partnership with the LA Area Chamber of Commerce. So it's all free, free resources, a lot of ample resources that anybody can go in and download and share uh, with their students. Okay, great. Excellent. Now, I'd like to ask Consul Hernandez to share uh, your career experience as a diplomat with the audience. Uh, Consul Hernandez, would you please briefly talk about your career path? Why did you decide to become a diplomat? And how is your job responsibility connected to international trade or international business? Thank you, Professor Pike and Marky for the invitation and to the LMU Center for International Business Education. Um, as you know, uh, Mexico is, depending on when you check, but it's the second, right now it's the second largest trading partner of the United States, so that's big. But in California, it's even more important, so it's your most important uh, trade partner. Uh, and that's why I uh, really appreciate that, uh, that I was invited as a uh, as a council that represents uh, the, the on, on the trade side, um, Mexico here in uh, Los Angeles County. Um, so I want to share with you my, uh, as you asked, my uh, like my career as a diplomat. As you say, it, I'm a I'm a member of the Mexican Foreign Service, so I'm a diplomat, a career diplomat, um, but with a focus on trade. Um, how did I get into this? Uh, being bilingual. Um, all of my uh, summer jobs from in high school, and uh, there they had they had to do with business and with uh, American people doing business in Mexico. So that's how I became interested in international trade. I I did a, a bachelor's degree in international trade, and then moved on to uh, government jobs in the Mexican IRS in and the and the equivalent of the Mexican uh, commercial service. Um, so I, I've always worked like in government positions within the government of Mexico. Then uh, I decided to take the exam to become a, a diplomat. There were 1400 people applying for 35 places and I was able after taking lots of exams to uh, be selected for this in my second uh, try. The first try I didn't, I didn't make it, but um, on the second try I, I did. 
So um, this is an option definitely for those of you out there that have like double nationality or are, or are Mexican nationals, you can probably have this career path. But I also want for those of you who are uh, uh, American, American citizens or, or uh, I want to give you like the equivalent of what would be uh, for, for, for American citizens, just so, so you have it and definitely look into the, into the guide that uh, Ruth Emanuel prepared for more information. I'm just going to give you like the basics. But in the U.S. system, uh, it would be something inside the U.S. Department of State as a foreign service officer. Uh, and they have like several career tracks. Uh, so one of the consular management, public diplomacy, political, one of the career paths is economic. Or also in the U.S. Department of Commerce I, as part of the U.S. Commercial Service, uh, which is not exactly the same as being a, a foreign service officer. And it's, it's kind of different. Um, but in the case of Mexico, right now during this administration, the last three years, they have been kind of the same position. So it's kind of a challenge to do what a diplomat would do and on the U.S. commercial service side, what, what they would do uh, together. Um, so the, what are the kinds of things that I do in, in this position and that it's similar to my colleagues, uh, to the colleagues that I always work with in, in the U.S. government? So we uh, basically we maintain relations uh, with the United States or with the region that we are assigned to. We have to keep good relations. Um, we have to develop these relations with all of all the important economic figures, uh, either chambers, companies, uh, government, local government, academia, etc., and for us to foster these relations so that there is a good image of, in this case, Mexico and the trade and the business possibilities with Mexico and the opportunities uh, with, with uh, my, my home country, Mexico. We promote Mexican and uh, economic and commercial interest. We do uh, economic analysis and reports of the, all the time uh, that we send to our headquarters, uh, to our capital, so that they know what's going on in this region. Um, and in the more like in the U.S. commercial service part, uh, more than fostering relations, etc., you really, really work specific cases and specific projects that are valued in the in the in the millions or in the uh, number of trade missions, etc. So it's more like case to case working with companies uh, from your from your country to help them export or to attract foreign direct investment. So that's kind of a little bit of the of the difference. So in my day to day, um, what I what I'm going to tell you more like what, uh, what I have what I am doing right now, uh, because I, it's kind of explains what my day to day is. Uh, so right now we are organizing. Um, we event do events all the time. We have an aerospace summit, California Mexico Aerospace Summit in May, where we, we will have 30 Mexican companies come here and do B2Bs uh, with um, uh, California companies. We will be in the World Trade Week, Los Angeles area, uh, opening breakfast with a table talking about opportunities with Mexico. We are preparing a high level agenda for a high level Mexican official that will be here for the famous Milk and Global Conference where he will talk about business opportunities with Mexico. We are all the time generating reports about what's happening in LA, such as mergers and acquisitions of companies that are based here. What is happening with the backlog at the backlog at the maritime ports? Uh, we, and on the U.S. commercial commercial service kind of side, we are all the time advising Mexican companies that are interested in the LA market in multi sector, and advising LA companies that are interested into expanding into Mexico. And that looks like a in a sort of foreign direct investment or or product sourcing uh, uh, thing. So uh, I was also asked to talk about the lows and the highs of a government position in, in international trade. So the lows are that you don't get sent to the places that you like all the time. So I've been sent to New York and then to LA and I love it and I really enjoy it and it's so international and everything, but I could be sent pretty much anywhere and I could be posted to, normally it's gonna be something on the trade side, but since I'm a diplomat, I could be assigned to a consular post if, need, if the need be. So you always, and, and you're there to serve your country. So you have to know that that can happen. Um, you're away from your family very often. You, you're not there always for them when, you, when they need you. Um, you are uh, aware all the time that you're not earning as much as you would be earning with similar uh, uh, trades and similar training 
in the private sector. Uh, and I will, I will talk about the highs on that side too. And you have to remain very professional reg regardless of your political preferences. Uh, it's more about the country you represent and you have to keep that to yourself and just be professional. So on the highs, you're able to serve others. So that would be like, uh, so just not making money for me, but actually helping other companies and all, all other people and my country uh, be economically successful and have jobs, etc. Uh, you get to do a lot of networking uh, and you have access to lots of events that you would otherwise not be able to to afford and you're going to be like there and know what's going on, etc. Uh, and you have job security, uh, which you might take for granted right now, because right now everyone's understaffed and there are lots of options out there for you. But when it comes to a depression or something, or like, for example, I just had my baby and I had from my country three months of paid uh, paid leave, then, then when, that's when you value the job security. Um, you About the core skills that you need, I would say, um, you, of course, you need to have like a trade, international business, economic background, but it's not always necessary to have that background. You can get, have training after for that. Uh, I would say, and that's where I would ask Marquis to share the slide uh, that, I, uh, that I had, if she would be so kind. You have to be able to adapt. So this, this I took from the careers.state.gov website, and it's just a screenshot. And when you look at the career tracks for foreign service officers and what is needed, the first paragraph that you get is when, hi when hiring foreign service officers, we look for motivated individuals with sound judgment and leadership abilities who can retain their composure in times of great stress, even dire situations. So you have that, that's a skill that you really need to have. And then you keep reading and again, the trade and the business and all that, but you definitely need to be uh, ready to serve and prepared because you never know what's coming uh, to you. So uh, ability to adapt all the time to the different businesses, business culture. So in the case of Mexico, I always have people that uh, wanna come and do business here and they have like one hour presentations uh, that no one's really going to uh, pay attention to. So you have to tell them that business culture is different here and how much time they have to really communicate what they want to communicate. And that's just an example of how uh, you have to be aware of the business culture and how it's different in different places and uh, learn uh, how to uh, navigate that. Um, and then, uh, of course, you have to be uh, and uh, also be capable and uh, willing to develop relationships and make connections all the time, not just people, but like, like ideas, like be creative and say like, what if we do this? And what if we introduce this person with this person and something great can come out of that? That making connection is like part of the diplomatic identity. That's what we do. We build, we build bridges, we build connections. So that's something that you need. Um, so again, we have a uh, we have a, an internship opportunity thanks to collaboration with with LMU that I am that would be the next slide, Marky, and it's just a screenshot so that you can identify it in the Handshake platform. Uh, but LMU uh, um, is helping us share this uh, opportunity. It's an unpaid opportunity, but if you have some time and you would like to have an opportunity of practicing your Spanish, uh, intermediate or advanced Spanish, and you want to practice it in a business context uh, and learn more about one of the most important trade and business partners uh, with, uh, of the United States, um, then you are very welcome to, to do an internship with us and we'll, we can help you with that. That, that would be it. Professor. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much. Muchas gracias, um, Consul Hernandez. So it sounds like that pursuing a career in public sector, you need to have a sort of lofty goals and then you should have a, some kind of ambition to try to make some bigger contribution rather than just thinking about your, yourself and then maybe that the, your companies and your countries and, and et cetera. So that's probably the reason why you choose to pursue your career in the public sector rather than <laughs> private sector. That's okay, right. your, your, your smile means I think that you said yes. Okay. Um, I'd like to move to our next speaker. Um, 
Jerry, uh, he's representing the private sector career in international trade or international business. So Jerry, would you please introduce to the audience what kind of responsibility you have with DHL and how did you start your career in international trade or international business? Yes, thank you, Professor. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. Great, so I, I prepared some slides as well that I was gonna share. Sure. Um, let me just uh, let me just get this up here. <clears throat> okay, so I'm moving. I'm moving this into a presentation setting. Uh, so hopefully you, you can all hear me, see me, and see my presentation here. Um, my name is. Jerry Feeney, and uh, I'm with DHL Global Forwarding. I'm going to go through my bio, uh, an overview of DHL, some supply chain stats, and then some recommendations for young professionals seeking a career pathway in the uh, international business arena. So um, currently my position with DHL is manager of strategic customers. Um, that means that I work with some of the uh, world's largest brands uh, and, and customers in getting their products to and from wherever they need uh, in, in the world. It can involve uh, helping customers um, bring in parts or finished goods to and from Asia, to and from Europe. Once they arrive, we have to uh, figure out how to get it cleared through customs and how to get it distributed throughout the U.S., um, my career path was was very unclear. Uh, I'd say actually, I, I had uh, I, I was I had a very hard time choosing a major, uh, and that's one of the reasons I like to do these type of events uh, is, is really with young students in mind. Um, and and by the way, fun fact: my sister Serafini, she got her business degree from LMU as well, and she's a guest on this uh, on this call. So I'm really happy she's here and. Um, she's, uh, I'm sure she would support my efforts in, in supporting this, these type of events. Um, so my sister and I both, you know, and, and Ruth mentioned this earlier, but uh, we lived abroad. We lived in Mexico for a couple years. Uh, and, and just that alone was, was enough to really um, kind of open our eyes to life outside of the U.S., um, and, as well as international trade, finance, business, etc., uh, so I think growing up in LA, I, I was born and raised in Los Angeles and uh, didn't really think much about other places uh, until I left the U.S. So that's when we became very internationally minded. Um, and it's really interesting because if you look at places like Mexico or really any other country, there, there's kind of an inherent focus on global trade. Uh, people in Mexico are already learning English when they're in school, right? They're thinking of, of, hey, how can I get into a career in trade or some sort of international career? But in the U.S., it's not necessarily that same that same path, right? A, a lot of times, students in the U.S., they, they look to domestic markets, right? And they're focused on um, you know, computers or marketing and, and, and all these other majors, media, right? Being in LA, media and, and things like that uh, take center stage. But um, I, I think global trade uh, it, it has so much potential, especially for young students looking to really broaden their horizons and get new experience. Um, my sister did major in international business. She got me thinking about it. Uh, at the time, I was uh, I was in El Camino College, a community college, and I was also working. I could, I could never afford to not work and just go to school. I was always a working student. So uh, I and and I was fortunate enough to fall into global trade and logistics as my first real job. Um, my mindset at the time was, I'm just going to do this until I figure out what I really want to do, and then make that change. Um, surprisingly, over the years, uh, it's turned into much more than that for me. It, it went from just being a job to being a career. Uh, and I've now been in global trade and logistics for uh, 23 years now, um, five years with DHL. And um, I, I also serve on various boards and committees. Uh, I did get my bachelor's degree uh, from Cal State Long Beach. Um, I've had the opportunity to participate in some postgraduate programs uh, with Hamburg University of Applied Sciences. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I, that's how my path kind of led me here. And it, it was, it was not intentional by any means, uh, definitely started with, um, not knowing what I wanted to do and then finding an opportunity here in Los Angeles and developing that opportunity. 
Um, and since then, I've been able to have some really great experiences that both include a tons of travel to various places, um, as well as some really cool events. DHL is, is a major company globally, um, and we sponsor some really cool things like Formula One races. Uh, we sponsor New York Fashion Week, as well as Fashion Week Abroad, where uh, DHL is a sponsor of Paris Fashion Week and uh, other things. So there's there's all sorts of opportunities for, for global um, global activities and, and, and just fun events that I didn't think I'd ever be able to experience. Um, so on, you know, some of these numbers have changed since this data was, was published in 2020 or 2021, um, but uh, it hasn't changed too much. So I'll just keep it brief. Um, DHL employs about 570,000 employees worldwide, and that includes over 220 countries and territories. Um, a large portion of our uh, staff is within Germany. Um, DHL actually started in San Francisco by three gentlemen named Dalsi, Hilblom, and Lynn. It's since been acquired by the German Postal Service. Uh, so that's why you see the Deutsche Post DHL and our headquarters is in Bonn, Germany. Um, our EBIT in terms of, uh, in, in terms of global uh, earnings before interest in taxes uh, in 2020 was 4.8 billion euros. Um, we deliver almost 50 million letters per working day inside of Germany, uh, almost 6 million parcels per working day also within Germany, uh, and then 26,000 sales points uh, throughout Germany. Uh, our express division delivers uh, over, over a million time-definite international shipments per working day globally. Um, in the air freight arena, we have 3 million tons of air freight that we move per year. Uh, 2.8 million TEUs of ocean freight per year, uh, and we manage 15 million square meters of warehouse space globally. Um, so those are some high level stats. Um, and, and again, as Ruth mentioned, we are a very global company, but we have a huge presence here in Los Angeles. Um, and I think that's what really um, makes this relevant to students of LMU trying to figure out what's next after college. Um, here's some interesting ideas, right? The, the, the Global trade has changed so much uh, from 2019 to today. It, it's incredible. I, I was actually at a port event this morning, and we were just talking about some of the changes that have happened, especially during COVID. Um, and if you can see here at the, uh, the lower right side of the screen, we have the World Container Index. It used to cost about $2,000 to ship a 40-foot container from Hong Kong to Long Beach. That same container now, uh, is upwards of $10,000. I've seen rates much higher for an express container to get from China to US. It's, 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 it's selling at in the range of $20,000. That's incredible when you look at that jump. A lot of this is due to, as many markets, is due to supply and demand. Um, COVID created some really interesting um, phenomenon, which I think uh, we're all seeing in some way. We were, we were kind of laughing at it earlier in today's conference, but we were saying how a few years ago, nobody knew, nobody thought about supply chain. Supply chain was an afterthought. Nobody cared about it unless you were doing it like we are. Uh, but now everybody's talking about it. The, all the, it's, it's affected the computer industry. It's affected the, the automotive industry. It's, it's affected every industry. And I think what happened with COVID, people couldn't go traveling as much. People couldn't go to ball games and concerts and all these other fun things they, they love to spend their money on. So people started consuming, right? E-commerce boom was just incredible during COVID. People were at home, couldn't go many places, so they were shopping. Um, and that demand and consumer, consumer behavior created this, this record-breaking year. 2021, LA Long Beach ports had more volume than they've ever had. But in addition to that, you had this work shortage where some employees just, there just wasn't enough labor out there. People were leaving jobs, uh, even, even just the, the workforce during COVID. You couldn't have as many people unloading a container or loading a container at the same time because of COVID restrictions. So it was the perfect storm in many ways between the spike in demand and the lack of, of, of workforce, right, and skilled labor. So now... We're still dealing with this, and, and experts are saying this is going to continue on into 2023 before we we see things normalize, uh, if ever, right? So um, all of all of the experts kind of agree that um, this spike in demand should be settling around 2023. 
Um, we definitely have an over-dependence on China, which, is, which has been highlighted. I think that started pre-COVID, right, during the, the trade war. Um, we advise suppliers to diversify their sourcing strategies uh, so that it's not all from one place. But we experts also agree that our dependence on China won't be going away anytime soon. Uh, there's still so much investment and mutual reliance between China and U.S. trade. Um, but we are definitely seeing some diversification of sourcing strategies into Mexico. Uh, and other countries as well that are, are just uh, outside of China. Um, but you, you know, there's, there's just so much going on in the world. And I think as a student, um, it's, a, it's a very interesting time to get into this industry. Um, and we need young talent. Uh, DHL, we have so many career, we have positions open. Um, I encourage any, anybody on this, on this webinar to go to careers.dhl.com. Uh, there's a variety of, 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 of opportunities that are available. Um, and one of the things that I think is really great about DHL uh, is that you we're in every country, essentially. There's very few countries that we don't have a presence. Um, and for people who want to maybe start working here and then maybe transfer abroad, those opportunities exist in a big way. I'd say bigger than any other company I've seen. Um, I, I, it's not uncommon to be walking around DHL Los Angeles and meet colleagues that are from other countries that have transferred here. Uh, similarly, I've worked with many colleagues that have transferred to other countries uh, and now work in, in London or in Singapore, uh, in Africa, right? So people transfer around, you know, internationally. So foreign posting uh, is, is, is definitely uh, an opportunity that we offer to our, our, our employees. Um, so I'm going to continue moving on here and just kind of leave some, some recommendations to the, your, your, these college students, um, which is that, um, you know, they're, they're, these challenges are, are not going away. And, and what we've seen from importers and, and companies that, that, uh, that have done well despite, I mean, many companies have, have suffered during this time and experienced tremendous supply chain challenges. But the ones that did really well and that are, are, are managing very well, they established relationships with their suppliers long ago. So it's not new. They, they had these relationships with their suppliers. They invested heavily. And those relationships have, have been, a, in many ways, a, a, a way to, to mitigate some of the, the challenges that um, COVID presented. Um, Again, the logistics industry is facing a labor shortage at every level. So if you want to be a cargo handler, that's fine. If you want to be an executive, that's fine as well. We, we have openings at, at every level. So it, whatever you're into, and I think the other thing that often goes unnoticed is that within companies like DHL, we have different positions, right? You, you can be very technical. You can be a computer. You can be an IT major, and we still need you at DHL. You can also be someone who's in sales and marketing or data analytics. Uh, I, I mean, there's so many opportunities within e even a logistics company like DHL. Um, so definitely worth exploring. Um, the other area that I think is, is, is important to recognize here is cybersecurity. Um, with international trade being what it is today, um, international uh, internet security, cybersecurity is is a major topic, and and companies like DHL, we need to protect our data. One of our largest competitors, Expeditors, they recently had a cyber attack, and many of uh, large Fortune 500 companies are dealing with the impacts of these cyber attacks. So th that's another area. If if some of your students wanted to have double majors or things like that, uh, definitely a great area to to focus on. Real estate, today at the port <laughs> event, we were talking about real estate within the, the port district. So if you wanna become an industrial real estate specialist, you can do that. And I think that's one of the things that really attracts me about this, this field is that you're not pigeonholed. So if you go into, get into a career pathway in international logistics, global trade, you're not just stuck in one area. You can, you can dive deep into different disciplines and, and really find a fruitful career. Customs compliance and regulatory compliance are also some niche areas within our industry where there's a, a strong demand for, for experts. Uh, if someone wanted to go e even a step further, you could get your customs broker's license. This license is very hard to obtain. It has, it has a 20% pass rate on, on each exam. They have two exams per year. Um, but if you can become a, a licensed customs broker, you, you'll have no trouble finding a, a really good job um, or career path, I should say. Um, and, and the other recommendation I make to college students is to invest in your own talent. 
um, and, and, and develop skills that are transferable, right? Like project management, things like that. I think those are skills that will help you no matter where you are. And for your students, your students are investing time, even in events like this, this is great for you because where else would you hear this, right? When I was your age and I was in college, I didn't, I didn't get access to working professionals that were giving me information about their industries, which I, I wish I had. Um, oh, it looks like my time's up, <laughs> but I'll, I'll wrap it up here. Um, again, if possible, try to join a larger organization like DHL. I think the reason I say that is there's so many opportunities. Um, there's so many benefits that, that come with working for a large employer that I think it really opens up career opportunities. Um, and, and then the last thing I would say is to develop your professional networks and connect with people. Um, your professors are great to stay connected with. I remember my sister, Sarah, who was an LMU graduate, she would also stay in touch with her old professors. And um, it, it's just a valuable thing. Uh, stay in touch with even your peers, right, as you graduate of like, hey, what are you doing? And you never know if you're going to be able to help someone later or if they're going to be able to help you. But just invest in your network, invest in your talent. Uh, and that's all I have today, Professor. So um, thank you for having me. I'm honored to be a part of this discussion and I hope I provided some benefit to this discussion and to your students. Thank you so much, Jerry. Um, I think the one thing I really like about your presentation, you mentioned even within a single company, there's a wide range of jobs available to pursue international business or trade career, starting from, you know, some technical jobs and um, you know real trade expert and etc. So that's great. So to know that you know, you you keep hiring at a lower level, entry level, and the middle level and higher level. <clears throat> so it was also quite interesting. You update the situation in the bottleneck in the sort of global supply chain. Then um, so. Suppose if you decided to pursue your career in international or global supply chain or logistics, you already mentioned that some of the skills and it was quite interesting to listen to actually that if possible, you probably you wanna join the big company because we will continue to see the M&As in the future. So I like to ask all the panelists, even though in your individual presentation, you mentioned what are the real skills that um, you suggest to the students to acquire before they graduate. Um, are there any particular skill sets that you recommend? Maybe then some kind of different skills between the private and public sector. So can I ask uh, Ruth and Jerry first from the private sector, maybe that you guys can integrate what you have already told us. Uh, what are the, some of the competencies? And Because I know that, that you spend time in 14 countries and uh, you participate in the internships and study of the program and etc. But what would be the sort of good way and most effective way to prepare your career down the road if you decided to pursue your career? Anything related to the international trade or business? Maybe Ruth? Sure. Uh, I think one of the common themes that I heard in both uh, Consul Hernandez and Jerry's and then my uh, topic was um, the topic of adaptability. Okay. Um, that was really a core competency. It's not necessarily um, specific to language training, but it's just kind of a mindset yeah. that you're yeah. used to when you're thinking global and that mm -hmm. you evaluate different perspectives. And then another one that I would add is uh, cross-cultural communication skills. I think more and more of us are going to be working with partners across the world, with teams around the world. So the ability to understand uh, other different points of view and empathize with other different experiences and that cross-cultural communication skills, I think is going to be uh, huge in the international business arena. Okay, great. Jerry, do you have anything to add? Yes, um, I agree with Ruth. Uh, definitely understanding how, how different uh, cultures do business. I, I think that's, that's highly transferable and something that's going to certainly help you uh, when we're working in this industry. Um, I would add also, um, I mean, you know, some of the ba very basics, almost too basic to, to mention, but you're, the whole you know, current programs that are used, but Microsoft programs, I think, are, are, are highly needed. Someone knows how to use Excel. 
very well. They're going to be an asset to us. Um, we do a lot of we we process a lot of data on a daily basis. Uh, we're looking at shipments that come in, dwell time. We're looking at costs. We're looking at weights. So, so knowing how to manipulate data and report on data is 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 very valuable to us. Um, but then, yeah, I think an, an overall knowledge of how supply chains work, understanding some of the terms that are, I'd say, not really used outside of, of supply chain, like the INCO terms and, and things like that, can be very valuable. Understanding, you know, what a TEU is or what a ton of air freight is, um, things like that. Um, those are things that, that would set someone apart. Let's say if you had two college students applying for a position at DHL, one of them knew those things and one of them didn't. Those would definitely make that, that person stand out as someone that has a, 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 a good foundation that we could then train upon. But, um, but yeah, that'd be it. In addition to just um, you know, what, what Ruth said and some basic technology, knowing Excel, project management, uh, and, then, and then understanding industry terms. Okay, great. Council? Do you have? Yes, Professor. So uh, again, I would repeat uh, that the ability to adapt. Of course, that it's not that you have it or not. That's something that you can work on. So trying to learn languages uh, is something that not many people are willing to do. But when you do, it helps you like understand other cultures, uh, traveling, uh, intern, doing internship at the Mexican consulate, just to get this um, uh, to learn to adapt to other other cultures and other business cultures. And then on the hard skill side, uh, for, for me, for my department, from my experience, I would say definitely, uh, just like Jerry said, data analytics, that's something that is needed throughout like different careers. Definitely always welcome either Excel or, or some more uh, complex software, but have that. And also never underestimate uh, a good writer. So writing skills, like good writing skills, those are useful like anywhere because people even judge you as to like, oh, that email, you know. Uh, so good writing also important for reports, et cetera. I'm sure you already saw that one of the students that posted the question and um, um, Rondo wants to have more information on the internship. So maybe you can put it in the chat box or Rondo, you can reach out to Marky, our assistant director to get more information on that. Because all of you mentioned the adaptability and flexibility and cultural intelligence or cross-cultural competence. So in that regard, I'm just curious about how important for students to acquire another language, because you all speak Spanish fluently. I know for console, this is a mother tongue, but as you see that, you know, her English is um, almost perfect. So how, uh, how do you think that, that, you know, those people who wants to pursue a career in international trade or business, do you really strongly recommend that to pick up another language or, you know, language is important, but it is not a must. And then you, it is more important um, to, to try to understand the other side, the other party and adapt your view and broaden your perspective in order to work with uh, somebody from, you know, different cultural background. So could you comment on that? Maybe let's go to reverse and um, um, council you first. Okay, I'll, I'll take it. Sure, Professor. So for, for, for me, it's been very important. It's from the beginning, the difference between getting a job or not has been uh, speaking English, but also here in LA, it's so international that many languages come in handy. And uh, even if you just speak a little bit, it, it can really make a, a difference uh, as to like understanding other culture or, or even just trying, they will take Many cultures will try, uh, will see well that you that you try, like you're, you're like you're interested. So definitely, always handy. Okay. Sorry. Yes, um, I, I would I would agree that I think it's it, I, I I think it's beneficial for everyone to learn a, a second language uh, if they if they don't already know one, and that's a disadvantage we have here in, in the United States. I think that we're used to everybody speaking English, and and it's it, I I don't think it's it's helping us in, in that way. I mean, it's convenient, right? I can email anybody, and English is the international language, right? And most people respond to me in English. Um, and, and, and even when you travel, a lot of people can, can you, your odds of finding someone who knows English is, is, is pretty high, right, depending on if you're going to an international city. But it's something that uh, I think we're, it's, it's, we, we don't see the need to. But then when you go to other places and, and you see, hey, 
um, you know, they know three languages. I, I, I was in Europe once. I met a person who spoke like seven languages. And I said, wow, you guys. And they said, yeah, because we use them. You know, I go to Spain. I speak Spanish. Go to Italy. I speak Italian. I go to fr France. I speak French. Um, and so it's like they, they use these, these different languages. And I think it can be a true asset. Uh, for someone who who wants to take on an additional language, um, and and again, I like like uh, like like Consul mentioned, uh, when I was in Germany, I, I I made attempts to speak in German, um, and again, once the, I, they'd answer me quickly, I couldn't, I'd get lost in in their in their responses, but they see that I was trying, um, and similarly, if I'm if I'm emailing someone from Japan. Um, and, and I, I just make, uh, you know, a certain gestures that I know are traditional for them. So if I say, you know, Ruth's son or, or, you know, something like that, it's, it lets them know, hey, I'm, I'm aware of their culture and I respect it from a business perspective. So I definitely think it's, it's something I would recommend um, to, to, especially to international students. Ruth, just quickly, 30 minute elevator speech, please. Yeah, I, mean, I would say uh, seconds, not a minute. I, I would agree with both uh, mm -hmm. Jerry and Consul Hernandez. Fluency is not the goal. Uh, if, if you cannot be fluent, at least attempt to just know a couple of phrases. The goal is really to understand that culture and you taking the effort to even learn a few phrases shows um, that interest. Great, thanks. I'm sure the audience that you have a lot more questions. And so even though we have to end the webinar here, um, we'll be happy to share their emails. If you do have any questions, once again, that you can reach out to Center for International Business Education, uh, either me or our assistant director, uh, Dr. Marky Jones. So unfortunately, we are running out of time. I wish that we had more time for the Q&A session. Once again, thank you so much, Ruth, Jerry, and Beth for sharing your experiences and insights into international business career. Above all, I also would like to thank all of you who joined the webinar today. I hope that you have enjoyed the program. We'll be back with another program in fall 2022. Until then, please stay safe and healthy. Before you leave, I would appreciate if you could fill out the short survey at the end of this webinar. Once again, thank you so much everyone and good night. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.